Well, first of all, welcome to, to Oslo. I understand it's your first time here. Thanks very much, Stian. Yes, yeah. it is. I'm very pleased to be in Oslo and Norway for the first time. Well, you're well, very welcome. I thought we could talk a little about how, uh, for example, technology can uh, make us uh, reach our goals in reducing climate emissions. Sure. And uh, I understand you have uh, some thoughts about this. Well, we've done lots of things around this, Stian. It's a very interesting area and everywhere around the world, of course, is very focused on these things. So I, I think the technology is important, but the most important thing is applying it. And so it takes leaders such as yourself to decide that something is important. And I think increasingly business leaders are realising that some of these changes are possible and the technology is something that enables that to happen. And I think that's a very different shift. In the past, people have been very focused on technology for technology's sake. What, what I have found is that a couple of years ago, many people felt that uh, making uh, the necessary changes to, to adapt to climate change and to try to reduce the effects of climate change was, uh, in a way, the expensive choice. Mm -hmm. I think more and more people now are realizing that doing these uh, changes actually can be uh, the economic choice uh, for the future. Well, I, th I think that's true, and, and countries like Norway in particular, which have significant resources and clearly have a long-term history of planning for the future and provisioning well, really do understand that these decisions are not short-term things. And so I think you're absolutely right. People are realising that by applying technology, they can change the level of service for a long time and really change the way things happen. I mean, just in the time I've been here in Oslo, I've been amazed at the number of electric cars. So clearly people see these things as important in changing the way in which the climate is affected by how we live in it. We have, of course, quite a lot of incentives in, in, in achieving those goals. But what I think is it's interesting about the electric vehicle uh, schemes we have in, in Oslo and Norway is that it actually has proven to work. Mm -hmm. uh, electric cars are now uh, something that families buy. It's mm -hmm. not just the city of Oslo who, who buys electric car for cars for our uh, different services. Well, I think another thing that you're showing, uh, Stian, is something we see very broadly around the world in different regions, which is the blurring of lines between the public and private sector. So they used to be very separate. Public sector and government had a very clear view about what it did, and it kind of had a one-way conversation with its people, and commerce was somewhere else. But now we see, as you say, um, just to use your example, car manufacturers working closely with government around policy government's thinking about how do we integrate technology into policy that changes how people live their lives. So I think the, the, the embracing of the business community everywhere from large companies like IBM coming together with governments to deliver these capabilities and at the same time providing a technological richness that allows entrepreneurs to participate and really develop high value jobs locally. And that's something we see in our projects is the ability of these projects to attract talented people, highly educated people, people who really explore new parts of the economy, which over time, of course, delivers great value to the city. What I think is, uh, is a challenge for the public sector is uh, finding ways to engage the private sector in, in our procurements. Mm -hmm. City of Oslo, for example, we mm -hmm. make procurements for about 2.5 billion euros each mm -hmm. year. Mm -hmm. And how we make those procurements mm -hmm. uh, is, of course, uh, important, not just to us, but also in a way how to, how to, to engage the public sector. What we are trying to do now is uh, not do our procurements only in the traditional way, mm -hmm. saying that we want a specific product, mm -hmm. but more try to say we want uh, a solution to a problem. Mm -hmm. We don't know exactly how, what that solution is. Mm -hmm. And then we engage the, the private sector to come up with the different uh, solutions mm -hmm. to a problem that we, we specify. That's very encouraging, Stian. And again, you know, we see this in the private sector. The private sector cares less about specific things when they go to tender to buy something, much more about results. And we're starting to see that in the government. And I think there's a great parallel with, with electricity in a way. Um, you know, here in Norway you have an abundance of hydroelectric power, but when you use power you don't think about whether it's hydroelectric or whether it's nuclear or fossil fuel, you just use the power and you assume it serves the purposes you need. Keep your fridge, your food cold or power the lights or whatever you need it for. Heating house. Heating the house. <laughs> it's very important um, in Norway. Of course. Um, but you don't, you don't get all excited about whether it's hydro from Norway or whether it's been imported from Denmark or whether, you know, it's just the power. 
And, and I think that's the model where we're starting to see organisations say, we need management information about our transport system or about our water system or about how we manage buildings and energy. And it's kind of our problem to work out how to do that. It's our problem then to give you the information you need so you can make the decisions that you need to manage the business. But I think also that we in the public sector can also try to, uh, to lead by example. We, we, we are in, in Norway, the public sector is about 50% of, of the total com, uh, econom, economy. So what we do makes, uh, makes impacts. Big impact. And one example is we, we decided that we needed to renovate uh, a senior citizen facility. And we decided why do, why do it in the traditional way? Why don't we make this uh, a, a real landmark on, on new technology, uh, emerging technology, and uh, make it the real uh, environmental sustainable uh, senior citizens facility. And all the investments we made in this facility is uh, turning into a profit only in uh, five years. It's great, so it's yeah. actually very good economics to, to do sensible choices. Well, and I think there's a couple of things there. One of the things that, again, when you have a government as active and as, as significant as we have here in Norway, um, the, the rise of social networks is so powerful. So you can take ideas, this very valid two-way communication, which is very, very immediate, um, which is a great, a great value. And um, you, know, you, you think about how to do things differently. Um, innovation is so important now. Back to what I was saying earlier about the application of technology, you can take ideas from anywhere. And I think that's such a powerful thing that the new technology enables us is visibility of all sorts of things that we can apply to, to new and different ways of solving problems. One thing we as politicians need to, to be aware of is that when we uh, make our procurements or, or try to make a policy and, and engage the private sector, we, we know only about yesterday's technology. Mm -hmm. That's what we, we know about. It's mm -hmm. the private sector, it's businesses mm -hmm. uh, who knows about the current technology and even better, tomorrow's technology. And we can never uh, procure that because we don't know it. So we need to find these uh, ways to engage with the private sector uh, in order to get uh, the last uh, and best uh, opportunities there is. Well, and also sometimes try to, to, uh, to move the markets in a, in a direction. Oh, I'm delighted to hear it, uh, Stian, and really when we look around the world at the most innovative projects, the innovative cities, it's always a person, it's always leadership that makes the big difference. And I think uh, increasingly we're seeing cities rise um, in a way that national governments are kind of backing out of things a little. I think it was the former mayor of New York, LaGuardia, who said that mm -hmm. there's no democratic or republican way uh, to pick up the trash. That's and right. I think he's quite right. Yes. Uh, we can make uh, practical solutions and cities will eventually have even more, Im a greater impact uh, in solving these uh, problems. For the first time in history, more than half of the population live now in cities. That number will rise to 70% in 2050. We consume two thirds of uh, the world's energy and we uh, contribute 70% of climate emissions. So cities matter and cities are increasingly important uh, in, in, uh, in solving uh, these problems. Uh, I think um, cities like Oslo have something more to contribute. I think they're big enough to have these issues to consider but they're small enough that leaders can still do something about it. Um, I don't think it's nearly as easy um, to achieve these kind of results in the big cities of the world like Mumbai and Tokyo and Sao Paulo and, and New York, London, Paris and others. I think these are very complex places. Um, in cities like Oslo, I think it's much more achievable to bring everybody around an agenda and with the right leadership to get the results. And we can also, uh, if we make something right here, we can inspire bigger cities uh, right. and, and see if they right. can implement successes that we have. I and agree. then it will really make a global, agree, global impact. Yeah. It's very nice talking to you. It's been a pleasure meeting you. I hope you have a nice, too, uh, nice stay here I'm in I'm sure Australia. I will. Thank you very much, Dan. Hope Stian. to see you again here. You will. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Dan. Thank you.